Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. It's time for our new show this week in Israel where we'll give you the scoop on everything you need to know about the last seven days right from Tel Aviv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here to keep you informed. This morning we saw dozens of mortar shells fired from the Gaza Strip into Israeli territory, but just now we're seeing yet another barrage. Two rockets have apparently struck Israeli territory near a kibbutz in the region, and this mirrors a similar close call this morning when a mortar shell actually struck a children's kindergarten. Thankfully, there were no injuries, and Assistant Director of Standing Together, Ari Fold, has more from the scene. Hi, Iran. Ari Fold here. I'm on the border of Gaza in a kibbutz in the area. This, what you're seeing behind me, is a kindergarten. You can see the marks on the wall from the shrapnel that blasted through the wall over there. This tree is completely shaven down on the left side. You can see the damage inside the kindergarten uh, playground, also on top of the uh, shelf over there. Over there in the uh, pole, you can see a huge gash in the pole right there. A huge hole that blew through the pole from the shrapnel of the mortars. Uh, I have in my hand one piece of shrapnel. This place is covered in these small pieces of shrapnel. This happened at 7.30 in the morning, just minutes before kids and parents arrived here for their day in school. If this would happen just 20 minutes later, we would have had a real tragedy in our hands. I have to say the people here are unbelievably strong. Uh, the kindergarten is now packed with kids. Things are going on as normal here. The IDF has said that they're going to already retaliate. And as I'm standing here for the last 20 minutes, there have been explosions that I hear from the far distance, knowing that the IDF is already retaliating in Gaza. Um, again, not like reported 26, 27 missiles, rockets were fired at Israel, but rather 56 mortars have been fired, according to the IDF, into Israel in different areas. I am just standing in one area area in a kindergarten where Hamas was aiming to murder Israeli Jewish children. Now in both attacks, the shots triggered alarms throughout southern Israel and activated the Iron Dome missile defense system. The majority of these missiles have been intercepted by Israel countermeasures and no specific group has claimed responsibility for either attack as of yet. But this comes mere days after the Islamic Jihad terror cell promised vengeance over an Israeli retaliation that killed three members of the terror group on Sunday. هذا تصعيد خطير من قبل الاحتلال الصهيوني والاحتلال يتحمل كامل المسؤولية عن هذا التصعيد وتداعياته وليعلم هذا المحتل بأن الإجرام سيقابل برد للمقاومة Prime Minister Netanyahu summoned an emergency meeting today to discuss these mounting tensions إسرائيل غواء بخمرة التأتكفوت الليها والشوفيها على دي الحماس والجياد الإسلامي من رتوعة عزا צהל יגיב בעוצמה רבה על ההתקפות הללו. ישראל תגבה מחיר כבד מכל מי שמנסה לפגוע בה, ואנו רואים בחמאס כנושא באחריות למנוע התקפות אלה נגדנו. But on top of this, we've already learned that IDF troops have apparently demolished a smuggling tunnel built underground beneath the Gaza Strip. Though incomplete, the tunnel apparently already extended almost a kilometer into both Israeli and Egyptian territory. This is likely part of an ongoing IDF counterattack for these missile attacks, and the IDF has just conducted at least 35 airstrikes against Palestinian terror targets in the Strip. All right. American and European leaders have united to condemn this aggression we're seeing now out of Gaza. The United States is seeking an emergency meeting of the UN's Security Council to address the crisis. The Council is expected to meet later today to denounce Hamas's actions and demand accountability from Palestinian leadership. Multiple American and European Union leaders, including U.S. President Donald Trump, have publicly come to Israel's side amidst the biggest barrage of rockets from Gaza since 2014's Operation Protective Edge. France's Foreign Affairs Ministry has reaffirmed that they are, quote, unconditionally committed to Israel's security. For most, the message is clear. Firing missiles at civilian targets in Israel is very much the opposite of seeking a peaceful resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a position taken by representatives from both the EU and the UN. It may be worth noting here that Israel has often criticized the international community for not taking its side when it comes to situations like these. Israeli conduct during the 2014 war in Gaza were heavily criticized, despite the daily rockets fired into Israeli territory. But in this case, the world's powers seem to have collectively joined behind Israel and hold Hamas accountable for the violence. Following the most intense exchange of fire between Israel and Palestinian terror cells in Gaza since the 2014 war, things have returned to a relative calm. Both Israel and Hamas have upheld the ceasefire deal reached yesterday, 
but only after Palestinian terrorists launched at least 100 missiles from the Gaza Strip into Israeli territory. The barrages were mostly deflected by Israel's Iron Dome defense system, but a few direct hits in Israeli communities resulted in some moderate injuries and some very close calls. In response, Israeli defense forces launched a pummeling series of airstrikes across dozens of Hamas targets throughout the Strip. Army officials say they delivered one of the worst blows to Hamas in many years. Prime Minister Netanyahu has promised a swift and brutal retaliation if the ceasefire deal is broken as well. Meanwhile, though most of the world's leaders stood by Israel during these attacks, the United Nations Security Council failed to pass a resolution condemning Hamas for the violence. Kuwait stepped in last minute to block the vote, but leaders from France, Germany, and the United States, including President Donald Trump himself, publicly sided with Israel over the events of the last 48 hours. Israel has often accused the international community of bias when it comes to conflicts like these, but this time it may be worth noting that the tides seem to have changed, and now the world is finally pointing its fingers directly at Hamas. Unconfirmed reports from Arab media sources today have been saying that Israeli jets have just struck military targets in Syria just outside of Damascus. Witnesses say they heard explosions coming from a warehouse nearby, a well-known Hezbollah stronghold. The IDF, as policy, does not comment on alleged military strikes like these. If true, these airstrikes would have very interesting timing. Mere days ago, Russian leaders publicly announced that only Syrian forces should have a presence in the country's southern region, where Israel believes thousands of Iranian forces have currently entrenched. This change in policy is seen as a big win for Israeli leaders. Prime Minister Netanyahu has repeatedly pushed Putin to keep Iran off Israel's doorstep by extending the buffer zone. Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman is also in Moscow this very moment lobbying for the same. Russia is most likely hoping to defuse a very volatile situation on the Israel-Syria border. Earlier this month, Iran fired dozens of missiles at Israeli military sites in the Golan, the largest ever Iranian attack from the region. The Israeli counterstrike that followed delivered a pummeling blow to Iranian forces in the region as well, though. But with the fate of the JCPOA nuclear deal with Iran now in limbo, this is a problem that may be quite long term. There have been a lot of question marks around Russia's involvement in Syria. Specifically, Israel has lobbied hard for Russia to keep Iran off of the southern border, away from Israel's front door. While Russia's foreign minister has now delivered a very public ultimatum, one that seems directed right at the Islamic Republic. Take a look. Изначально договоренность о создании на юго-западе Сирии зоны деэскалации предполагала эвентуальный отвод всех не сирийских сил из этой части Сирийской Арабской Республики. Итогом всей этой работы, которая должна продолжаться и продолжается, должно стать, должна стать ситуация, когда на границе Сирии с Израилем с сирийской стороны будут стоять представители вооруженных сил Сирийской Арабской Республики. A bit of background here. Ever since the Syrian army began to drive Islamic State fighters out of southern Syria, Iran has seized advantage and injected tens of thousands of proxy soldiers into the region. Iran has also financed and armed the militias of Lebanese terror group Hezbollah. Russia entered the Syrian conflict some years ago, and though Russia lately has given Israel relative free will to carry out military operations in Syria, many worry which side Russia would take in the event of an inevitable showdown with Iran. But this statement from Foreign Minister Lavrov is the first public sign that Russia would probably rein Iran in, possibly in order to avoid falling into being at odds with Israel. Now we'll just have to see if this ultimatum truly carries. After fighting for his life in the hospital, an IDF soldier from the elite, Duv Devan Yudit, has succumbed to wounds sustained in the line of duty and passed away. Sergeant Ronan Lubarsky was part of a team conducting overnight arrests in a Palestinian refugee camp in the West Bank last Thursday. During the raid, a Palestinian suspect dropped a marble slab on his head from a pie. Sergeant Lubarsky was quickly rushed to the hospital, where doctors struggled for two days to save his life. 
Hundreds of Israeli citizens have turned out for Sergeant Lubarsky's funeral, held late last night at the Mount Herzl Military Cemetery in Jerusalem. Members of Lubarsky's unit praised the 20-year-old's bravery throughout his service, with Israeli leaders offering their sorrows. The Duv Dedan unit is an elite corps of IDF soldiers trained for making terror-related arrests in dangerous and often covert conditions. This year alone, Duv Devan soldiers have arrested over 150 Palestinian suspects on terror charges. Sergeant Lubarsky is the 18th soldier killed while serving in Duv Devan since the unit was created over 20 years ago, though notably one of the only ones killed by an enemy. An IDF manhunt is currently underway to track down those responsible for Sergeant Lubarsky's death. Israeli construction teams have just begun a massive new undertaking, the building of an undersea barrier through Gaza-Israel waters. The project is designed to thwart Hamas terror and potential infiltration coming from the sea, and the army believes construction will be fully completed by the end of the year. This underwater barrier, the first of its kind anywhere in the world, will consist of three strategic layers designed to deter terrorists. The undersea section will be topped with thick, brutal stone, upon which will be a layer of barbed wire fence. This barrier itself will then be surrounded by another section of reinforced fence. The state green lit this expensive undertaking following the 2014 Operation Protective Edge in Gaza. During that war, a Hamas naval vessel was able to enter Israeli waters. Hamas has continued to build its naval fleet and staged terror at sea ever since. But much like the IDF's underground barrier, which has detected and destroyed nearly a dozen terror tunnels in the past few months, this new barrier will be a cutting-edge layer of defense. The Defense Ministry aims to complete all construction within the year 2018. After years of delay, the state has just granted humanitarian status and A5 visas to 300 Sudanese asylum seekers living in Israel. Still, though this is seen as a major win for this community, which has been petitioning for full re refugee status for nearly a decade, Tens of thousands of applicants still remain unanswered. Notably, humanitarian status is a step below actual refugee status, though the A5 visa does allow recipients to legally reside and work in the state of Israel. The Israeli government has long defended its refusal to grant refugee status to the nearly 40,000 asylum seekers living in the country. The vast majority, who are mostly Christians from Eritrea and Sudan, say that they fled war, genocide, and service in a slave army for a better life in Israel. The government originally intended to forcibly deport every last African man, woman, and child from the country. This plan came under intense scrutiny by the world's nations, especially since it would have deported families to a third unnamed African country with a history of human trafficking. Prime Minister Netanyahu reached a deal with the UN some months ago in which the UN would resettle half the migrants to safe Western countries in exchange for Israel absorbing the other half. But intense outrage from Netanyahu's right-wing coalition partners caused him to cancel this deal mere hours after praising it on television as the best possible one. Although the state still has yet to process thousands of requests from African asylum seekers, this is a victory for 300 of them, and one that gives them at least a temporary opportunity to thrive in the Jewish state. Now, both Prime Minister Netanyahu and his wife Sarah are facing a number of corruption allegations, and now several of those police investigations appear to be coming to a head. We've just learned that state prosecutors are strongly leaning towards criminal indictments against the Prime Minister for allegedly receiving nearly a million shekels worth of illicit gifts from his millionaire friends. Meanwhile, Israel's Attorney General has apparently informed the Prime Minister's wife Sarah Netanyahu that the state will criminally charge her for fraud and breach of trust. She allegedly diverted nearly 360,000 shekels worth of taxpayer money for her family's own personal use. Other sources say Attorney General Mandelblit has ordered Sarah Netanyahu to reimburse the state fully for the alleged misused funds, after which time he'll decide whether or not to indict. Sarah Netanyahu, though, has reportedly rejected previous plea deal offers, saying she'd rather go to jail than reimburse the state or admit any wrongdoing. Meanwhile, investigators are said to be wrapping up yet another case of alleged corruption by the Prime Minister. This one, dubbed Case 4000, alleges that Netanyahu gave telecom company Bezek regulatory benefits in exchange for favorable coverage in the Walla News Network. The Netanyahus, however, have repeatedly maintained that they committed no wrongdoing in any of these allegations. All right, now a seminal turn of events this weekend. Disgraced Hollywood film producer Harvey Weinstein, whose alleged sex crimes against women sparked the watershed Me Too movement, has finally surrendered to police. Weinstein has been arrested in New York City, where he has just been charged with rape in the first and third degree, in addition to various sex crimes and charges. He has posted bail for $1 million 
and will plead not guilty to all charges. Mr. Weinstein um, will enter a plea of not guilty. We intend to move very quickly to dismiss uh, these charges. We believe that they are constitutionally flawed. We believe that they are not factually supported by the evidence. And we believe that at the end of the process, Mr. Weinstein will be exonerated. Weinstein appeared at the Manhattan courthouse for all of 10 minutes on Friday to submit for arrest and then write a $1 million check to post bail and turn over his passport. A judge has fitted Weinstein with a GPS monitoring device while he awaits trial. At this time, more than 100 women have emerged with horrific allegations of rape, abuse, and sexual misconduct committed by the former Hollywood producer over the last several decades when Weinstein's film company ruled the red carpet. These women say they stayed silent because Weinstein threatened to destroy their careers if they ever went public. Last November, it was revealed that Weinstein actually hired an Israeli intelligence firm known as Black Cube to sway or even discredit his alleged victims and to keep them silent. In many cases, New York's statute of limitations has already expired on many of these alleged sex crimes, closing the possibility of prosecution. But police say they do have enough evidence to prosecute Weinstein on at least two rape charges. These carry a maximum sentence of 25 years in jail each. Since the allegations against Weinstein erupted last year, the Me Too movement has seen a wave of men and women rise up against sexual harassment. The impact of the Me Too movement cannot be understated, having reached just about every corner of the world, including here in Israel. Needless to say, for many of Weinstein's alleged victims, this is one of the moments Me Too has long been waiting for. What would you say to him? Like, if he, if he were watching this today, what, what would you say to him? We got you. We got you. Yeah. You did. Powerful. Well, the royal wedding may be over, but the UK's royal family is set to make history yet again next month. Prince William will be visiting Israel for three days in the end of June. This is the first ever state visit by a member of the British royalty since the time of the British mandate more than 70 years ago. This trip is part of a region-wide tour, and Prince William will begin this journey in Jordan before flying to Tel Aviv on June 25th. He'll then remain in the country until the 28th, during which time he'll also visit Palestinian leaders in Ramallah. Prime Minister Netanyahu hailed this historic trip when it was first announced back in March. While this is the first official state visit from a member of British royalty, other members of Her Majesty's family have been to Israel in the past. Prince Charles actually visited Israel twice, for Rabin's funeral in 95 and for the funeral of Shimon Peres in 2016. Additionally, this visit comes at a time when the UK's influence in Mideast affairs is becoming increasingly unclear. The United Kingdom will soon withdraw from the EU, making this visit seemingly something of an attempt to retain influence in the region. Still, though England often butts heads with Israel over political matters, the UK does hold massive business ties with Israeli firms, which peaked nearly $7 billion in trade last year. So either way, Israelis are mostly just excited to finally catch a glimpse of a real-life prince in the flesh. Israel's southern resort city of Eilat just received an extraordinary visitor. I'm talking bigger than Kim and Kanye, bigger than any president, even bigger than Beyonce. This one, uh, this one visitor is actually one of the largest mammals on Earth, a rare, beautiful, endangered blue whale. What you're seeing now is the first ever evidence gathered of a blue whale in Red Sea waters. Typically, these majestic creatures never stray so far from deep waters because their diets demand more food than these areas can provide. That's why this visit was a short one. This 20 meter long whale came within just a few football fields worth of a Lutz shore. When sailors and marine experts first spotted it in the sea, they figured it was a smaller, more commonly known whale shark. There's never been any record of an endangered blue whale, of which there are only about 12,000 on Earth, in these waters. Marine scientists are gushing over this incredible sighting while documenting its journey through the Gulf of Eilat. They made sure to keep their distance and allow the aquatic giant to swim uninterrupted. On the scale of whales, this was actually a smaller specimen, believe it or not. Blue whales can grow up to 33 meters long with huge fat masses under their bellies. Even though this whale is a bit on the skinnier side though, experts say he still looked completely healthy. Either way, his visit was more than welcome. And now ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh has the top five of the week. 
This week marks the start of the very first cocktail week here in Tel Aviv, and I couldn't think of a better way to help you guys navigate through the week than to give you the top five best cocktail bars to check out in the city. So let's get started. First on our list is the Imperial Craft Cocktail Bar, known to be dedicated to the lost art of the cocktail. Last year, the Imperial Bar was awarded the best bar in the Middle East and Africa Awards, so come in and choose from over 150 custom-tailored cocktails, and trust me, you won't be disappointed. Next up is one of my personal favorites, Spice House. This cocktail bar is designed like a medicine lab from the early 20th century where guests drink from lab flasks. In accordance to the concept, waiters and bartenders wear doctor's robes and the interior is decorated in a unique pharmacy theme. Located on one of the busiest streets in Tel Aviv, you can't miss this bar on your next trip to Israel. Third on our list is the absolutely unique Bellboy Bar. Anything and everything you can think out drinking out of is offered at this bar, whether it be a seashell, a mini bathtub, you name it, they probably have a drink poured into it. Bellboy's atmosphere can be characterized by its 1920s prohibition style, carefully chosen designs, and extremely well-dressed bartenders. This is a bar you'll never forget coming to no matter how much you drink. Cocktail Bar 223 is fourth on our list. The drinks served at this bar are made by award-winning bartenders who know how to create both a complex yet creative drink. The 20s jazz music really helps set the mood and the location is absolutely unbeatable, but hey, don't take my word for it. Come for a visit to the Holy Land and check it out yourself. Last but definitely not least is the Double Standard Cocktail Bar here in Tel Aviv. Have you ever taken a sip of a Bloody Mary but in an actual blood bag? Yeah, I didn't think so. How about a drink straight from a shark's mouth? Yep, didn't think so either. Unique and creative drinks is an absolute understatement when it comes to Double Standard. They have to be one of the most daring and out of this world cocktail bars I've ever been to. And trust me, the drinks taste just as good as they look. That's all for today's top five, back to you. That's it for this week's Roundup. Tune in next Friday for our next episode of This Week in Israel. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from Tel Aviv.